Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I'm here on Project Fuku with Slobodan Stankovic in Switzerland and I am looking at a whole bunch of materials that he's collected that we might choose to experiment with and if people have got things that they think we should be doing with these that would be interesting to hear. Anyway, uh, top left you can see boron and why is boron interesting to me? Well, at 2000 uh, uh, and uh, what was it? It, it was a, it was an ICCF 21 in Colorado. I sat down with Francesco Tilani and I said, I think boron might be key to some of the production of excess energy in some of these experiments. And I said, the reason being is that when we tried your uh, it, changing your uh, Tilani reactor to having fused quartz based on your recommendation of what you're going doing next. We didn't see any excess heat, so we went back to using a borosilicate tube and our, we started this experiment on 12 seconds past 12 minutes past 12 on the 12th of the 12th of the 12th um, in California time. And uh, within a, a day or so, we produced 12.5% excess heat. And I thought that maybe that's because of the boron in the tube. Pian Telly said that if you had these protons coming out of your Lenner reaction uh, at 5.6 or, or 6.7 or something mega electron volts, that they would interact with uh, your boron 11 and uh, produce uh, carbon 12. And so that would be an eight neutronic uh, reaction. So I thought that might be going on. And the reason that is interesting to me is because also uh, the Maycor was a machinable ceramic in the center of the uh, Piantelli, uh, classic Piantelli and Ficardi uh, reactors and uh, Maycor has I think uh, 12 or 13 or something or 14 it might even be as much as 30 percent but it's quite a lot of boron in it uh, to make up the machinable ceramic and then uh, Parkamov told me that in one of his early reactors he actually sent me one of the cores and he chose boron for the core of uh, his uh, reactor, the tube in there, and he asked me to, to look at the inside and the outside of that particular sample that he sent me. So he obviously thought that boron was important in this, and I spoke about this in my ICCF 22 presentation about his work. And so I was recounting all of this to um, uh, Francesco Cellani, and he said, oh, you know what, um, boron was in uh, the support for one of my earlier reactors, and, and we had a thermocouple inside this boron uh, based uh, ceramic tube. Uh, I think it might have even been Maycor. Uh, the, and he said uh, the thermometer inside the tube was hotter than any other thermometer uh, in the rest of the reactor. And that's interesting because the heat was coming from the, the resistance of the uh, uh, constant and wire. So he couldn't understand why that may be. Well, later down the line, uh, so that was kind of like a real-time kind of uh, discussion on that. And and then later down the line, uh, I uh, came across uh, Alexander Shishkin in, uh, in the uh, Cold Nuclear Transmutation Conference in October 2018. And he was using a boron-10 neutron tube to detect what they called string vortex solitons, which are... Uh, a neutral form of magnetotoro electrical radiation, which he says are the same thing as the exotic vacuum objects of Ken Shoulders, but the neutral form, what Ken would call a black Evo. And these interacted with a differently biased uh, boron-10 neutron tube uh, to produce a 50 times uh, normal deflection than a neutron uh, signal would detect uh, when the interaction of these this radiation. So that got me thinking that cold neutrino condensates, which he thought string vortex solitons were, or cold, uh, um, or rather black evos, they uh, might interact with uh, um, boron. And that actually, because it's boron 10, it isn't this boron 11 to carbon 12 reaction. It's actually some sort of interaction between uh, boron and itself and the cold neutrino condensates that come in. And if these are coherent matter, which they necessarily must be, they might cause the boron to fuse together. And if you get, let's uh, say, two uh, boron uh, fusing together, I think you get helium, uh, you get neon 20. And if you get two neon 20s fusing together, i.e. you get four boron atoms fusing together, you get, guess what?
calcium. <laughs> this stuff, calcium, calcium 40. So uh, there could be a lot of energy gained by that mechanism. So it's, it's again, it's an aneutronic mechanism, but it's a straight fusion mechanism. So we have some boron here. We can try that. Uh, and the other thing is that these are neutral and the, the Russians call them fake neutrons. So uh, I thought, well, maybe uh, indium uh, might be suitable because it's another in, uh, neutron absorbing material like uh, cadmium and like gadolinium. And I felt that um, uh, these elements might be very, very important for uh, excess heat uh, generation. And so that is the reason uh, principally that I chose indium as uh, the material to take to test in the vibrator and uh, a Mazagas gas uh, um, uh, technology in Japan in 2019. I also chose indium also because the vast majority of the two isotopes in indium is a beta isotope. So I thought that if it is able to create coherent matter and it does the same sort of thing that potassium would do in this potassium carbonate here, that... Um, it would uh, uh, stimulate uh, a more vigorous reaction, and I believe that's exactly what happened and why we saw those fantastic volcanoes of transmuted material coming out of the indium exposed to a Mars gas. So um, we have this, so we have the pe pill press here, uh, the pellet press, so we can maybe do some mixtures of these various things. Now, the other thing here is zirconium, and zirconium also uh, has one uh, less isotope that has, I think it's even a double beta decay or a beta decay. Uh, people can go and check on that. And um, this effectively, zirconium is the first uh, I isotope um, in the periodic table, other than like uh, tritium, but the, the first primordial isotope that actually has a uh, a, a decay isotope, uh, like 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 in in that sense, uh, or rather, it's the the heavy one. Anyway, anyway, the point point being is I've, I've got that wrong, but anyway, um, z zirconium is the preferred metal of choice, the re preferred refractory metal of choice by uh, Solin in his December. 1992 uh, uh, um, quantum coherent uh, reactor and I believe that this is also because it has this beta isotope in here so we have this so we can maybe make some uh, pellets of that we also have some tungsten here so uh, rather than just the tungsten welding rod we have the tungsten uh, to consider as a powder that we can make some pellets and then we have a whole selection of reagents here so we have quartz silicon dioxide this is obviously uh, piezoelectric uh, and so that has some interesting properties. We have iron here. Obviously, this is the anchor that I would say uh, was combined with the aluminium in the uh, work of uh, Yul Brown. So Yul Brown would take aluminium shavings and iron pieces. And my hypothesis for the way it deal dealt with radioactive waste was that it took the... Uh, the aluminium is the single isotope, 27 aluminium, highly conductive. I believe that this is enabling the production of the coherent matter. So the large body of coherent matter. This produces magnetic monopoles, which are discussed uh, in the Solian pattern, um, which are uh, the pseudo-magnetic monopoles, and they are solitons of uh, uh, one or other magnetic charge, uh, obviously uh, uh, north and south magnetic charges. And that these attach themselves to the iron. And when you go through the Curie point of iron, which is 7, 8, 100 degrees uh, centigrade, uh, the built up monopoles then immediately release themselves and uh, form a cluster. And the cluster in, is enveloping the radioactive material. And that does a uh, self compression. And this causes this electronuclear collapse that is talked about by. Uh, um, uh, our, our friend Takaaki Matsumoto and Takaaki Matsumoto observed the production of carbon uh, in whatever elements he put in. This is the same thing that is in the patent of Eul Brown and I believe that this is the sequence of events that it goes through. So what we could consider doing is taking the aluminium, the iron and the tungsten powder Making, mixing that up in a crucible like this, making it into a pellet and doing an experiment like Yule Brown. And if we start with aluminium, iron and tungsten and we end up with a large amount of carbon at the end of the experiment, 
then we could consider that we can use this technology to fix the other waste at Fukushima um, uh, without actually having to deal with uh, any particular radioactive materials in the experiment. So that's what I want to talk about. We've got some molybdenum over here and we're going to put the gas on here and we're going to use a spot pyrometer or something on here to look at the temperature that that goes to like we did with the titanium and the uh, um, uh, tungsten with a Mars gas. So this is similar to that but with molybdenum which we didn't test in um, Japan, in Tokyo. But for me, the, the real big win here is that we can make a pill or multiple pills out of aluminium, iron and tungsten powders, mix them up, make a pellet. And if we can synthesize a lot of carbon out of that combination, then I believe we have an answer to the rest of the radioactive material at Fukushima. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. And uh, thank you for sharing your time with me in this video. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.